everyone, Merry Christmas. I hope everyone had a great time with your family and friends over the weekend. To start out this episode today, I'm going to read a little passage from the Odyssey because it has something to do with the podcast today. There's a, por- there's a part in book, I believe it's 17, when um, there's a beggar at the palace and he's going around to the suitors and he's asking for food. And Antinous, the lead suitor, says, O oh, most distinguished swineherd, why did you bring this fellow to the city? Do we not already have enough other vagabonds and bothersome beggars to ruin our feasting? Or now that men gather here to eat up your master's substance, is that not enough? But you had to invite this one also? And the beggar looks at the lead suitor and he says, Give, dear friend. You seem to me of all the Achaeans not the worst, but the best. You look like a king. Therefore, you ought to give me a better present of food than the others have done, and I will sing your fame all over the endless earth. Well, the lead sing- suitor, uh, Antinous, actually doesn't give him any food. Instead, he throws a footstool at the beggar and hurts him. And then somebody says to Antinous, the lead suitor, Antinous, you did badly to hit the, unha- the unhappy vagabond. A curse on you if he turns out to be some god from heaven. For the gods do take on all sorts of transformations, appearing as strangers from elsewhere, and thus they range at large through the cities, watching to see which men keep the laws and which are violent. I love this part in the Odyssey. You can tell a good book because the cover's almost falling off and it's almost falling apart, right? Um, Before I get to today's podcast, I just wanted to say um, this isn't a normal podcast about war and peace like I usually do, but sometimes we like to get off topic here on the podcast. And I had a friend named Peter um, who I recently met in the last six months, and I just thought he'd make for a great interview. I've had some really great conversations with him, and I wanted to share um, some of his wisdom with my audience. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Um, But before we get to that, I just wanted to make a short announcement. Um, I announced back in November sometime that I was starting a new business called Teach to the Text, and I will be coming out with a class on the Iliad in January. So I just wanted to announce that I have the study guide done. Here it is. I'm very excited about this. Um, Basically, this represents 10 years of my life teaching the Iliad and all the things I've learned about what students tend to, the questions they tend to have, and the things that they find interesting, and the things that they often overlook, that they don't often see the first time they read the book. So I've sort of put all of that together in a study guide. Um, And I'm really excited to share it with with those of you who might be homeschooling parents or no homeschooling parents. Um, There's a list of project options in the front, different papers, argumentative papers, analytical papers, um, creative projects. And so um, the point of this study guide is really to teach kids how to read epic poetry and then to help them get the most out of the story the first time they read it. So the whole idea is contemplative learning. We're going to go really slow through the text um, and make sure that we we appreciate everything that's there. Um, So I'm only going to be teaching one book at a time as a part of this uh, new company called Teach to the Text. And I don't know if you can see that very well, but there you go. So I just wanted to let you know if you're interested in learning more about Teach to the Text or um, being notified when my first class on the Iliad is available, hopefully in the next 10 days to two weeks, um, please sign up for the newsletter down below. That would be great. And then I will be sending out a discount code um, that you can use to buy the first first class on the Iliad if you're interested. And there will be more, um, more of a website coming soon and more information about that. So anyway, um, and after the Iliad, I look forward to doing a study guide for the Odyssey as well. So um, hopefully you can think about those passages from Homer as you're listening to today's um, podcast. And so I hope you enjoy meeting Peter as much as I have, and God bless. Hello and welcome to episode 65 of the Catholics Against Militarism podcast. I'm so excited to be here on Christmas Eve with my good friend Peter, who I just met a few months ago. Hello, Peter. Hello. How are you today, young lady? (laughs) I'm doing great. Um, I decided to bring Peter on the podcast. Um, He is a local here in my town that kind of wandered into our our town a few months ago, and um, he's become a part of our church family. And I was speaking to him um, one time, and I just learned a little bit about his life, and I thought, you know what, more people need to hear 
from Peter and hear about his life and his faith. Um, so we're, we're doing a little bit of a, a strange setup here today. Uh, we have one microphone that we have to pass back and forth between the two of us. So if you can just be patient with us, but hopefully the audio will, will still be good. Um, Peter, I thought we could start out today. Um, we live up here in the Rocky Mountains and you were discovered, when was it, in June? Uh, June 3rd. June 3rd, somebody found you in the park. Um, the in park rangers. the park rangers, uh, found you on June 3rd in Rocky Mountain National Park. So can you just tell us, let's just start there because that's kind of what your introduction to town. Um, what were you doing up in the park? What brought you there? And, um, what happened when they found you in the park? Well, uh, first of all, I'm from, uh, I'm walking in from Denver and yes, I'm walking from Denver. It took me four days to get here. Uh, I got, uh, kind of surprised on how the animal wildlife here happens but uh there's this big storm coming in and and i had to tarp down is what i call it because i didn't have a tent i only had a tarp uh i'm coming in homeless so uh the lord has blessed me every single way every step of the way but i uh i was able to uh see some of his nature out here in uh the good old rockies <laughs> Being how I'm from a desert, I am from Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, real close to the border of Mexico itself. But uh, <clears throat> I was blessed to come up here to Colorado and experience your guys' nature by uh, a storm coming in. So I tarped down one night and uh, it started raining real bad. It just came down and I kept thinking that I was right next to a river so... I was going to get flooded out because everybody keeps showing me pictures of this big Thompson River flood and stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> I got scared and I kind of bedded down. Of course, I'm by the river and uh, <clears throat> a little animal came by and you can hear him going. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was sniffing me. You know, I, know. And, and and I was I was scared. I didn't know what it was. I heard about bear. I heard about the wolf. I heard about this and that. And I'm just really scared. Of course, I'm not even going to peek out of my tarp until this thing decides to get a little, uh, uh, grab in my leg. You can feel his little teeth all the way around what? my my calf, and he took a little bite, and I screamed I like the biggest the girl. <laughs> I screamed like the biggest little girl. I scared every animal within 20 miles away. I know I did. On my way up here, uh, walking through Glen Haven, I met this man, and he said, there's a storm coming. Uh, would you like to come and sit down into my house for a while? I know that you're, you're walking. I know that you're homeless. And he acknowledged me. It was the Lord. I know it was. The Lord brought me into his home, and he gave me some coffee, and he fed me. And then he gave me a ride to this Park. From Glen Haven with my bicycle and whatever I did have as a belonging which is just my clothes <laughs> I was headed up toward uh, uh, Washington State because I'd never seen the ocean before and my parents are gone I don't have nobody to take care of no more I have a very big family of 15 brothers and sisters but they all have their own lives so I thought the Lord would take me in his arms and show me a little bit of his life. The life that we're supposed to be seeing. The one that we're supposed to be seeking. So I'm headed up toward the Rocky Mountains and I pass Sheep Lake and and I pass this other lake and and I see a storm coming. <laughs> the funny thing with the storm, it always makes you acknowledge it. <laughs> It's big enough to see, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, I bed down, and I'm like maybe 100 yards away from the road. And all I'm trying to do is just spend the night and take off. But the Rocky Mountain Forest Rangers show up and said, Sir, <laughs> you're not allowed to be here. I said, I cannot camp in the forest. <laughs> they said, Yes, you can, just not this forest. <laughs> So then they brought me back to Estes Park. They gave me a homeless person, a camping ticket 
over for Aspen. I think it's Glen Aspen Campgrounds is where I spent the night at. Mm. Which they gave me permission to. Which the Lord opened another door for me. No, can I ask a question? Do you do you know was it it was sounds like it was illegal for you to be camping where you were. Um but they didn't it sounds like the police really worked with you to help to help set you up for the night, right? Did you find that they were rude or friendly or like how were you treated by them? Young lady, I'm an ex-convict. I uh I have an arson to commit murder charge. Rude is not the word for these very graceful people that help me. This is a way of how I'm supposed to look at life now. When I was the person I was back then, I was very hateful. So the people who were actually trying to help me, like the authorities, I was very hateful to them. Mm -hmm. And I was against righteousness. And I can say now that the Lord's kicked me in the butt hard enough to turn my thoughts around as well as my faith. There's nothing like him, and there's no one like him. If any time that I was in need, whether I was homeless or even just going through the prison life that I was going through, all I had to do was ask, and he would open. He would open his arms to me, and he has given me, and continuously gives to me. The officers here in Estes Park gave this homeless convict a bicycle and registered it under their name for him because the Lord opened the doors. The Lord has changed me to go and ask people like this for help instead of causing them problems now. Um, so it sounds like you, you came up from Denver, you were walking the whole way. You had somebody pick you up in Glen Haven. For those who aren't familiar with Colorado Front Range area, we have the Front Range, which is where Denver and Fort Collins and Loveland are, and then you go up the canyon up to Estes Park, which is where we live. Um, and Glen Haven is sort of up in the mountains. It's a town between the Front Range and Estes Park. 15 miles. Okay. So, but, all, but from Denver to Estes Park, I don't even know how long that is, but you walked the whole way? Okay, so you're walking this whole way, and did you have a lot of people? It sounds like you had a lot of people stop and um, offer you food and ask if you needed a ride. Is that true? Uh, I, I got blessed enough to where these people didn't only stop and pull over. They offered to have lunch or dinner with me at the spot that I was at. They stood there, and they offered their companionship. They uh, offered their love. They understood what I was going through. Uh, and they wished me the best of luck through the Lord's love. As he gives it, as he gives it. He, I mean, I got to meet their kids and I got to meet the family. Mm -hmm. That's just out there in the Garden of Eden, just <laughs> lost like everybody is. But the Lord blessed me with his love. He just pours his grace on me. I got here and I was living behind the Safeway here in Estes Park for a little while. So this is, um, so after you stayed at the campground with the, they ho hooked you up with a night at the campground and then you made your way to the Safeway and you thought that you would just live behind the Safeway? Is that right? Mm, yes. A homeless person just looks for a place to lay down his head. Somewhere where we can stay out of sight. We like to be by ourselves a lot because we feel that the world don't understand a lot of things that we're going through. Although a lot of things we all each have individually gone through alone. And some of us have gone through it with God. Mm -hmm. The ones that go through it with God, it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. He makes it so much easier. For his yoke is not heavy at all. It's the one that we place on ourselves. We make this world hard on ourselves. 
I haven't driven since 2004. I have not had a driver's license. I decided that my drinking was more important. But I knew that if I continued to drive and drink, that I was going to kill somebody. So something had to get put back. I have not driven since 2004, we are 2022, because of my wrong decision to want luxury, or is it because I feel for other people and I think that I shouldn't kill somebody instead? My Lord has been with me all my life, not just because the two years that last two years that I have had homeless. He's just opened my eyes these last two years and show me how much we take things for granted. We can get up here and live here for 40 years of our lives and never really notice the mountains. Look how big they are. But people are so into themselves and this world that they forget what God really gave them. We should be happy enough just to thank him for the breath of air that we get. Mm -hmm. And that's every morning. And I don't want to be here. All I want to do is die so I can give my Lord Jesus the most biggest hug and never let him go. <laughs> that's all I want to do. If I can do that, I know I'll be very blessed. Very blessed. But I don't want nothing from this world. Nothing. The Lord placed me a homeless person, an ex-convict, into the middle of the Garden of Eden, right in the split middle. He said he took it away from us. Oh, no, he just hid it, and little bits and pieces are here and there. I know they are. <laughs> I got a picture of God's feet. I went up to Gemstone Lake, or Jim Lake, I believe it's called up here in Estes Park. Uh, it's going up into this uh, national wildlife place called uh, where the Twin Owls are. Gorgeous place. Gorgeous. Uh, so I walk up there and the first thing I seen was a, a homemade angel made out of a rock that the Lord had made for me. And I saw the angel and so I kept going and I was actually up there because I needed to take a bath. I'm homeless. I don't know my way around here at all. I just got into the place, I'm maybe like two weeks in to Estes Park, and I need a bath. <laughs> I've been walking for miles. I can smell myself, and it gets bad then. So I go up there, and I, I'm looking for a place that's secluded where I can go and take a bath. And the Lord has all kinds of pools up there for me. Just perfect. I'm a little guy. I'm only five, two and a half. But let me tell you something. I fit in just about any little pocket. It's, I do. It's and a half. Don't forget the half, right? That's what you told me before. <laughs> I saw God's feet up there by one of these pools. And that's the pool I chose. What do you mean, God's feet? They're, uh, the rocks. I have a picture on my phone. The rocks, and they look like feet. Is what they look like. And they're oh, huge. I want to see those. They're huge. And uh, they look like God's feet. So I call them God's feet. <laughs> and that's when I knew that that was the pool that I'm supposed to get into so I can take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how long were you living behind Safeway? And um, what was that experience like? I think you told me that what I what I love about you, Peter, is that you you're always so grateful for everything, and um, you you're so positive. Um, it sounds like you when I've talked to you before, it almost sounds like it was a great time for you this this period of time when you were living back there. What did you do every day, and how what was your experience of Estes Park during that time? I like to uh, I wanted my Lord to take care of. I've, I got into it with one of my younger brothers over the estate of what my parents had left us. And uh, greed settled in. And all we did was fight. Over their stuff. Over the house and the property that they had left us. And uh, 
I got so upset that I pulled out an 18 inch dagger and I put it into his throat. And that's when he told me, Peter, are you trying to kill me? And I told him, yes. And when the Lord opens up his heavens, he opened up his heavens. He opened up his heavens to me and said, Peter, you're done. Pick up your cross and follow me. I asked the Lord to take me away from Las Cruces, New Mexico, because there was nothing but hell for me. Mm. When he brought me into the state of Colorado, he showed me nothing but the Garden of Eden. There was nothing that I didn't want that he did not put before me. Whether it was a cigarette, a beer, just something hot to eat. Somewhere to use the bathroom without getting into trouble. When I left, it was COVID, full-blown COVID. I got to Colorado and I lost my hearing. 80% gone, I'm never getting it back. Left side of my hair. I can't hear, I'm deaf. And I'm thanking my Lord. Most people would be cussing him out. But let me tell you something. You hear half the BS that people have to offer nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to tune it out, right? That's right. Definitely. And I still have my good ear for him, so that's yeah. what matters. <laughs> The Lord has opened his arms to me. A homeless convict who had a lot of hate in him and changed me around. He changed me. Mm -hmm. He slapped me in the face and told me, look, I'm your jefe. I am your daddy. I am your pops. I am your boss. I am. That's what he told me. And he also told me, when you need, you come to me. Mm -hmm. You don't go to nobody else. When I was walking the streets of Denver, not knowing anybody and homeless, there was people left and right offering food, a sleeping bag, a tent, a hot plate, something. I got blessed to come out here. You don't see that stuff in New Mexico. Mm. Especially for the homeless. Mm. You don't see that stuff in Arizona for the homeless. So, I think it's... So, you felt that when people were giving you these things, it was just... It was directly coming from God. Were you... How was your faith at this time? Were you praying for his help? Or... Was he just, was this just grace? Like he was just giving you this help? How did you f think about that? Um, and also I was wondering, you said that God kind of woke you up and said, I'm your father and you need to rely on me. Did that happen like over gradually over time or was it really that moment with your brother when you felt some him saying something very strongly and very directly in that moment? It's kind of a lot of questions, but... I want to know more about this, and I want to. I guess I'm asking: Have you always had such a strong faith, or is this something that's just happened in the last couple of years since you've been through all of this, your homelessness, and going to prison, and all of that? Uh, I think within the last couple years, twelve years back, starting when I took him with me to prison. You took him with you to prison. I took him with me. You don't take God with you to prison. Because you, you're a hardcore, you're a murderer, you're a rapist, you're a this, you're that. Take God with you to prison so you can come out and never go back. And never go back. Take him with you and show the love that he still has, even for convicts and prisoners. My Lord loves everybody. I don't believe in categorizing people such as, forgive me for this, Lord, because I don't believe in it, Catholics, Christians, Methodists. I believe in God's children because he wants 
that not one perish. Not one. And I see that in him. He doesn't want not one of us to fall. Mm -hmm. My faith in him has always been since my parents used to tell us when we were kids, you better stop playing in, on the table or, or the devil's going to come get you with his pitchfork. To scare the fear of the Lord in a child is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Even if people think it's bad. Scare the fear of the Lord with love. Though. Not like my mom did and said the devil's coming after you with a pitfall. <laughs> <laughs> it's a one way of putting it. <laughs> Is this thing still on? I hope so. Let me just... um. Okay, I guess we're just going to trust in God that this is still recording. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, then how did you end up at our church? You did end up at the Catholic Church because all of a sudden I started, I started seeing you at morning mass. And I was like, who's that? You're sitting by my friend Chris and I'm, you're hugging everybody and you always have a big smile on your face. And I started, I thought you were just in town visiting. I thought you were maybe her friend or something, and then you were sticking around. So you stuck around. So how did you end up at the Catholic Church, and um, how have things changed for you since you were living behind Safeway? Uh, the, the green light. Oh, it's still on. You're good. Yeah. The Lord blessed me with a very beautiful companion by the name of Eric. Eric used to be the old maintenance man. I took his spot over there in the church. I went to the church not seeking a job. I just wanted to volunteer a little bit of my time and give back to the Lord a little bit what he has already given me. So I wanted to work for him. I wanted to go cut weeds for him. I wanted to I wanted to do something for him. So I went to the church. And uh, that wasn't my first time at the church. The first time at the church, because I lost my Bible. And that's when I first met your friend, Chris. And she's the one who got my Bible for me, two days later. These two days later, I show up to the church, and I just want something to do for my Lord. So I get there, and the uh, deacon stand, and uh, Father would not allow me to work. So I was kind of getting a little agitated. I said, what's gone wrong with this world? You cannot come work for my Lord's church. I don't want to be around nobody. I just want to go outside and do some yard work, you know, away from everybody and not, not have to mm -hmm. put up with, I call it society because we go with society. If we went with our individual selves and the Lord, we'd be so much more united. But we don't. We go with society and what we want our, menten our mentality to have. We, won't, we don't walk with the Lord like we should. I don't see nobody do that. Not even me. Because this world gets a hold of us. We want. And nowadays we're even worse. We want and we want it instantly. <laughs> it's kind of like, what do you guys call it? Oh, the internet. <laughs> I use a phone, young lady. It's a flip phone. I dial the numbers. I get somebody on the other side and I'm able to talk. Talk to them it's it's not a machine it's the real live person you know what i mean and in today's world we're missing that comfort that loving touch that comes only from a human and it only comes from the human heart it doesn't come from a damn machine i wonder if um so I spent some time working um, in Denver a few years ago at a place called Christ in the City. I think I told you about that before. And they were inner city, inner city missionaries, um, usually young kids just out of college that would go walk through the city. They didn't give away food. They didn't give away money. They just gave away their time 
and they would just meet the homeless and get to know them and befriend them, really. And pray with them. And pray with them and yes. talk to them. Um, and I was always surprised when I would go out on their missions with them at how sort of content and happy a lot of the people that we met were and also how interesting they were. I had, I admit, I had always been afraid of homeless people. I thought they were going to do something to me or attack me or steal my purse or something. I don't know. You know, you just grow up sometimes as a girl, you just grow up being a little extra protective of yourself. But I thought, wow, these people are so interesting, they have such interesting lives. And a lot of them didn't seem to want much. Um, and, and so I, I wonder too, they didn't, they didn't have the, I don't know, the iPhones and the internet and the Netflix and all this other stuff that kind of gets us wrapped up in this technology that you're talking about. And I don't mean to glorify or um, romanticize homelessness, but I think there's something to be said for that kind of uber simple living. I know in my life, there have been phases where I had very little, very little money. And I was very happy during those times. And I think about other times in my life when I was making a lot of money and I wasn't so happy. And so I don't, there seems to be a relationship there. Um, did you find that a lot of the people that you knew were kind of content in a way that maybe the people who were giving them money weren't? I don't know. Am I romanticizing things? No, because uh, first of all, <clears throat> the Lord was homeless. And he didn't have a place to go. And he was the happiest person that, in, that even walked the face of the earth. He was happy to be with his people. But he was shamed on the sin that we act upon ourselves. And upon each other. He was shameful of that. Homeless people are needed. Why are homeless people needed? Well, then how are you going to show your love? How are you going to show your love that comes from the very bottom of your heart? The one that really, that you want the glory to go to the Lord because it's His. That's Him. That's the Lord. And that's how I found Him homeless. Not found Him because I always knew where He was. Since I was a kid. But my faith. For it to grow. Within the last two years. To grow. To say here. I surrender everything to you. Everything. You're going to give me water to drink. You're going to. Give me something to eat. You're going to. Because he did it. Because he told me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Meaning, Peter, you don't need nothing but your cross. You already have it. You made your own cross. Now carry it. And let me help you. We're stubborn people. We're trying to be, oh, I'm head hunter all the time. You know what I mean? I want to do things for myself. Let somebody help you. Let the Lord in. Let him in. And with faith, know that he's going to do it. Because he's going to do it. That's why. I got bit by an animal ice cream like a little girl. Let me tell you. I'm not even from here. What kind of animal was it? I, I didn't even look under, out of under the tarp. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I was frozen still, still screaming down there. And I, I had to at least scream for at least 20 minutes. I had to. A, Peter, it could have been a bear. It could have been a little raccoon. <laughs> That's it. But I wasn't going to look. No. I wasn't no. going to look. Yeah. I got blessed to be placed in the Garden of Eden. At Our Lady of the Mountains Catholic Church, the Lord blessed me to see a wild bear. The first time I've ever seen one in my life, like that wild. Mm -hmm. This thing stood up on his hind legs. He went, <sniffs> smelled twice and said, oh, no, that little guy doesn't have enough meat on his bones for me took off but I was so blessed when I got to the church they didn't allow me to work so I go to the maintenance man and he's cutting the lawn he's using the lawnmower 
And I went to him and I said, sir, is there anything I can help with? I said, I'll do anything. He says, really? You'll do anything? I said, sure. He goes, will you get that weed eater and, and help go behind me? I said, sure. So I got the weed eater and I looked like Speedy Gonzalez with that weed eater. <laughs> I'm an ex-convict. I wasn't allowed to do volunteer work at the church. Why not? Because they need to do a background check. Oh, really? Yes. That I passed. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, I passed. So this this conviction that you went to jail for, is that still on your record? Oh, yeah, it doesn't come on. Is it a, what is it, like a felony? It's a, it's a second degree felony and the other one's a first degree felony. And they never come off? They don't come off. And so you're not allowed to work at the church if you have these convictions? Uh, certain types of convictions. Uh, oh. As far as like um, sexual. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine are violent charges. Okay. Which shouldn't be allowed anyway, I think. But <laughs> this world's kind of crazy, and I love it. I do. <laughs> because they're giving me a chance. They're giving a murder a chance to be a part of society again. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you don't see in this world anymore. People are always worried about the background checks and who's coming into my workforce, my workstation, make sure he's not from the asylum, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we don't open our heart enough and have faith in the Lord to bring us somebody who's going to do what we need to get done. I started working for the church. I'm allowed to do electrical and plumbing there. I've done all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> I am now going to class. I'm starting my confirmation class this time. I'm already, I think, halfway already. So you, um, you were baptized before. And did you, were you raised Catholic in the Catholic Church? Uh, my parents were raised Catholic. Okay. So, and all of us had to do our confirmation except the last three that were born. And uh, when I got to Estes Park, before I even started the church, the Lord kept telling me I had to go do my confirmation class. He was telling me. He was? So. Wow. I got to do them. And then our good friend, Chris, she's a, she's a blessed person. She's amazing. She was able to get me into the class. So. Okay, so now you need to, since you're in the confirmation class, you need to pick your saint. And I've, I've made a suggestion, but you're not sure yet. Who are you thinking? Which saints? Do you, are you still thinking about it? Or are you waiting for, for God to tell you who your confirmation saint is going to be? I already know God's going to tell me who my confirmation saint is going to be. Uh, I'm wondering if I need a saint at all. Mm. When they walk this world... I don't think they got confirmed into a saint like we do it. You know what I mean? I don't think they, these saints that walked, they walked in the Lord's footsteps. And I believe that he was their saint. Mm -hmm. They wanted to follow him so hard that they were martyred. They were mm -hmm. killed. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a blessing for me to be able to go through. As it is, I hate being in this world. Only well, the Lord will take me in his name. Mm -hmm. And in his glory. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm a homeless convict. I'm walking through his state's part. As this part, wondering what I'm supposed to do when he tells me to settle down. He gave me a job at the church. He blessed me with an apartment. My apartment got filled. I had nothing. Nothing. I had clothes and I had my bike. And now my apartment is so full of furniture because I've been so blessed by the Estes community. Mm -hmm. I get help from the village laundry, from the east side grocery store, from the Dollar General, from the Summit thrift store. 
uh, what's that? Elizabeth Gild. Gild. Yeah. This story. I go to Crossroads. There is nothing but loving people from one side of this town to the other. I have not met a harmful person yet. I got my bike stolen so I can get blessed with a brand new bike. <laughs> <laughs> Now tell me, was it something that the devil was trying to get in my way? Oh, he's not bad enough. The Lord's got me. He's got me. And he's got us all. We just got to let him in. We got to let him in. Mm -hmm. You got to give it to him. You, you got to say, here, take this from me. My arson to commit murder charge. I went after a brother that was always pulling out the guns on me and my younger brother. One of my brothers is 10 years older. He thought he was like Al Capone. Real hardcore into the dealing drugs and doing this and doing that. And I got tired of him for 17 years pulling out a gun on me and my younger brother. So I got tired and I rolled a five gallon gas tank of gas under his trailer and I lit it. And I did not run because when it exploded, it threw me seven feet. In doing so, my dad had a heart attack and I lost my father. And I carry a heavy, heavy cross. I have 15 brothers and sisters that I know look down on me for what I've done. Yet they still love me. And I know they're still there for me. The Lord says you gotta forgive. In order for me to forgive you. It's hard to forgive oneself. For doing something like that. It's very heavy. Heavy on me. I'm almost known as the little crier over there at church. Because I cry so much. <laughs> But I make sure there's enough Kleenex for everybody in case you guys go by. <laughs> you cry, Peter. Wow. Um, you just have such an incredible story, Peter. And I think, yeah, we're just so blessed to have you at the church. And I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. You just bring so much light to everybody and so much peace and um, just just happiness and joy. And, and we laugh a lot too. This is a serious interview, but usually we're just heckling each other and la <laughs> laughing. Um, but we're just, the whole community is just blessed by your presence. And so I just wanted a chance for people to hear your story and just to hear what a beautiful testimony of faith um, in the Lord that you have. Um, any final words for anyone who's celebrating Christmas and might be listening to this podcast? Well, bah humbug, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> But always remember our little baby Jesus who's going to come into this world tomorrow, guys. Remember him. When you open up your gift, open it up with the heart that that little baby has. Use that heart to guide you. And may you all have a very Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. God bless you, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Merry Christmas, everyone.